Hi. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Be Waste Wise. This is uh, Shweta Dandapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. Before we start today's webinar, I just want to tell everyone that uh, we have a crisis of monumental proportion in India. A lot of you must be aware of it with the second wave of COVID. In case you're not aware of it, do read up know about it and talk about it. There are many ways you could contribute as well, some of which include donations to independent organizations which are trying to arrange for oxygen, beds, and other immediate health support. I thought, I mean, it, it, because we, Harsha and I are both from India, and uh, I think there's a certain sense of, uh, it just seems very weird to be going on with the day when there is a huge crisis that's happening every day right around us. Uh, so moving on, it, and Harshad will touch upon this a little bit in uh, his presentation today as well. Uh, today, we are, uh, this is part two of the webinar that uh, Mike Webster and Mansoor, Dr. Mansoor Ali are organizing together. In uh, today's webinar, we're talking about uh, waste as a resource. If you have not seen part one where we talked about waste as a service, please head to the video panel section of the Be Waste Wise website. I'm sure you will find it there. And uh, today we have Mike Webster, who's the Chief of Waste Operations at Project Stop at System IQ, and uh, Dr. Mansoor Ali, who's a solid waste management expert. We also have Harshad Barde, who's the director at Swatch Pune, and Joe Bial, who is an emeritus professor and policy fellow at LSE Cities. Uh, and as usual, we will take your questions. Please use the Q&A section to put in your questions. Those of you who sent in your questions earlier, I've already sent those out to the speakers today. So over to you, Mike. Thank you, Sweater. Um, I'm at just, uh, it's fantastic to be here. Um, and uh, we've got two fantastic speakers. I'm actually just going to pass on to uh, Mansour now, who's just going to, I think, give a bit of a context to it and give some introduction. Um, the way that we'll run this is that, yes, Mansour will uh, introduce and then we'll hear from um, uh, Joe Beal um, and uh, Harshad Bada as well. And then there'll be ample time for Q&A. So um, Sweta will be, um, is very good at kind of managing and overseeing the Q&A. So please put your questions in the question and answer box. Um, what the way that we've managed it before is that um, the, if you have questions for the speaker, once they finish and the other person speaking, often they can respond themselves, uh, or if there's uh, time and a particular kind of theme and need, uh, we will have a kind of verbal Q&A at the end. So uh, without further ado, Mansour, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mike. Uh, let me share the screen very quickly. Um, you hope you can see, see slides now. Yeah. So thank, thanks, uh, Waste Aware, and thanks, Sweta, and all the organizers for arranging. Uh, my role is to introduce the, the topic. Um, and as uh, Mike said, we will be keeping quite a lot of time um, for q and I'm based in Loughborough, UK, uh, attached with the research program uh, with LSE Cities, uh, with Jobil, and also I'm starting my own startup, uh, which is learning and development. So in this, uh, this is a second uh, seminar, uh, second webinar. And in the first one, we talked about missing billions uh, in the system. And we talked about the lack of service services uh, in remote areas, small towns, and, and some challenges with the data and numbers. So in this one, we will be talking more about waste as a resource. Um, and we are trying to uh, push more um, towards um, a perspective um, on which me and Joe Beal and a number of people worked for, for a number of years that uh, waste is, is a very important resource for millions of people in the world. <clears throat> it's a livelihood for millions. And um, it's not about few waste pickers and few waste collectors working here and there. It is a very large system which is, uh, <clears throat> which is operating. And it is a reality for, for many countries in Asia <clears throat> and many in, in Africa. So people working, we talking more today about people working in waste collection as sweepers, uh, people working in waste recycling, 
um, uh, employment creation, livelihoods, part time and full time in uh, in recycling business and collection business, and we will be talking um, to a, um, uh, about a perspective which offers a solution uh, to the waste problem um, and do not see it as a as a problem. So very quickly, I, I just have three three more slides to show you, and I will hand over to to Joe Beal. Um, I mean, when me and Joe started uh, our PhDs 25 years ago, and now we are revisiting our PhDs after 25 years with a small funding from British Academy. Um, and we, uh, before us in 80s, there, there was academic work published uh, by people like uh, Shiva Kumar from India, Chris Furedi from, from Canada, um, and, and others who, who, who worked on that. But this practice is, is hundreds and hundreds of years old in, in, in Asia and in India. And I'm sure Joe, Joe will uh, talk about it. So from a, a partly technical point of view, there are waste buyers who buy separated waste uh, from household. There are waste pickers who sort waste in streets and bins. There are waste collectors who are working in many cities and offer primary collection service for household. And uh, what we are finding, for example, in case of Karachi, 55% of the city, which is a city of 26 million people, is now covered by um, these waste collectors. So it's, it's massively larger than of any official program or any donors program. Um, then the waste workers in different roles, uh, especially in recycling, and trade. So this is this is our perspective. Um, what is amazing, and we we are reading. I'm reading about it. I'm teaching about it for for numbers of years. And there are five things which are amazing, which are exciting uh, about uh, this system, which is we call waste as a resource. First is the scale of this involvement. So it's not about uh, you know few people. Uh, it's, it's, it's millions of people who are working. Uh, they have a very large impact on, on, on the system. So recently somebody shared a study and uh, it says that 56% of plastic waste, uh, which is recycled, uh, is through this system. And we also found, I also found in my own PhD that they reduce 25% of waste at source, another 15% uh, further in the system. The system is sustained. Sustainability is a big issue in development projects. Uh, this system sustained without any donors funding, without any government support. And they bring in uh, um, a uh, very exciting creativity, innovation, and adaptation, which we know very little about. Uh, but um, when we visit and when we read and when we talk to them, we find that this is the, the creativity innovation is, is remarkable within this system. And then there's a whole area of uh, what we call the ground level governance, uh, which is getting access to waste, ex getting access to this resource through negotiations with the power holders, who can be councillors, who can be ex councillors who can be a municipal super. So we, we know very little about this engagement, uh, but we, we are finding that there's a whole world of, uh, of, of, of lower level governance uh, and they are able to negotiate their access to waste because it is their livelihoods and it's very important for them. What is uh, challenging, and we are knowing about it, some of it uh, more recently through this research, that the traditional waste separation at source, which my mother used to do and my grandmother used to do in India and Pakistan, uh, is not pro protected uh, in large cities and, and those uh, kabadiwalas are under pressure. Uh, because of they need a storage space for their cart, their waste. They were subjected to, uh, a, you know, um, vandalism, theft, burglaries, all sort of thing, and even bribes uh, from, from the local police. So these, these are not protected. Unfortunately, it has not grown uh, as we expected. And I'm jumping on the finding, but this is what we are seeing in case of Karachi. Um, the policy and institutions are not uh, fully able to understand and use these small, small private sector and, and informal sector. And some of the very good initiatives are not adopted by the government and we expected them to do. And what we see is a trend in, in, in large cities and medium cities that large infrastructure, for example, waste to energy plants is still seen as the only solution to the problem. And in between the lines, it may be uh, it may be something which people prefer for, for 
lots of reasons which we 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 don't know and we can't discuss but corruption may be one of them uh, and then the last one is the majority of data uh, is not uh, uh, does not capture realities on the ground uh, and it some of it is not very uh, relevant so i think with this uh, 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 introduction um, i would like to hand over uh, to to joby um and i'm sure you will be uh, hearing uh, more uh, stuff from us so thank you very much uh, for organizing this and thanks for for giving me a chance hello everyone um i will just share my screen hey, joe i think it should be at the bottom of this yeah right got it there we are so um as manso said uh we did our research at the same time he did his in karachi where my arrow is and i did mine in faisalabad um we are looking at both cities uh, at the moment 25 years later very difficult because we're doing it remotely in the middle of a pandemic um and we're not quite sure how far we'll get the important thing to say at the outset though is what what mansur is describing uh, from the vantage point of karachi is an enormous city of 20 million uh, and with real complexities between local metropolitan and provincial government faisalabad in punjab province is a city that's grown over 25 years from 2 to 5 million um uh, a more compatible if you like relationship between city and provincial government and that's important as we go forward now what i'm basically going to offer you today is a case study a case study of um a city uh from an ethnographic uh, viewpoint now um here with the camel that's faisalabad in 1995 uh where my arrow is to the right that's faisalabad today infrastructurally still hugely challenged as you can see a waste system that still characterized by camels and donkeys in terms of delivery many households still keeping their own buffalo and cows for milk very traditional um practices um faisalabad nevertheless contributes um third to gdp from a, and and in the bottom right hand corner you see me 25 years ago and today so um i hope there's some wisdom uh, along with the gray hairs um the important thing in terms of solid waste management is there's been a shift from it, a management by the faisalabad municipal corporation to a, a government owned company the faisalabad uh, waste management company operated by um the uh, punjab uh, government now the methodology we used originally and which we can't uh, replicate now because of covid um is we first of all we followed the waste so from high income households and how they engaged middle income households and how they engaged with sweepers and low income uh, areas that had no waste uh, at all waste collection at all um we did surveys but we also followed the waste workers and engaged in participation uh participant observation both in their workplace and in their communities what i'm going to do now is very briefly introduce you to the different kinds of waste workers primarily um what you see is punjabi christian sweepers who are formally employed by the faisalabad municipal corporation in the past sometimes whole families were employed they had secure jobs with pensions they often inherited their jobs they operated a closed shop around access to jobs based on their identity and low social status this came from uh their um what uh, in india would be called scheduled caste status they converted to christianity at the end of the 19th century under the british and used that as a way of accessing these very desirable uh, protected jobs as you can see um they're not poor they um have gained 
uh, a sort of low middle class status over the years. Second group is the Punjabi Christian sweepers who don't have access to their jobs, but who are informally employed by the formerly employed workers to do the work they don't want to or can't do. So they um, are subcontracted, if you like, informally to provide door-to-door -door collection um, in private houses. So it may be a wife, a daughter, or some um, other person that they know. Uh, and so what you have is an informal private system within the public system. Um, and this is, uh, was well accepted. Supervisors knew about it, received a payment um, uh, for turning a blind eye. And all of this operated within a very heavily unionized system. And the unions protected the system that gave rise and protected that. Third group are the pickers. Now in Indian terminology, they, would, uh, they came from what would be called scheduled tribes, rural seasonal workers who as part of their seasonal uh, labor activities would engage in picking. It was a very formalized system as uh, Manso has described. This is not ad hoc, this is deeply entrenched. Um, they uh, divided the transit points and the dumping grounds. Um, they knew which halves were theirs. And um, they had in turn, very close relationships with the sweepers, uh, the Punjabi Christian sweepers. If you see here the guy in the purple, he's a picker. He helps the sweepers uh, do their work in order to get access to the picking waste for recycling before the trucks come in and mash it up. So very close uh, networks and social relations going on at each point. So what does this tell us and what have we learned since over 25 years? Well, we're in the middle of the research and doing it with a great deal of difficulty. So um, the findings are tentative. But as Manso has said, these arrangements have gone, have dated back for centuries. So they're not easily undone. Uh, and only recently have they begun to change. Um, the new employment rela relationships uh, in Karachi, these are often around contractors, private contractors, international contractors, like the Chinese. The employment arrangements in these circumstances are less favorable to the workers. There is um, a, an undermining of pensions, jobs for life, inherited jobs, uh, more precarity. Uh, so the closed shop of Punjabi Christian sweepers is breaking down, both in Karachi and in Faisalabad. Um, with greater poverty uh, and fewer job opportunities, more Muslims are being employed as waste workers. But the evidence that we're seeing that's coming through is that the really dirty work, uh, the work around sanitation, drain, uh, cle cleaning, wet waste remains with Punjabi Christians, often informally employed. The second big change is the influx of Afghan refugees to Pakistan. And they have come into the waste system and operate at every level. So at the very poorest level, they are picking. They move into the sweeping jobs, they move into the recycling jobs. And uh, what we're picking up in, in Punjab is their deep involvement in the recycling industry. So it's, it's still a blank picture, but it's that's a dramatic change. Um, as I said at the beginning, provincial autonomy is a very considerable factor. So, you know, just looking at two cities in Pakistan, you're getting a very different picture. What's interesting in the context of Punjab is that, and this is my last point, um, is that it's oper opted for a government owned company and has adopted an evolutionary approach in order to bring the unions with them. So there's no longer jobs for life, but they are still operating with the same workforce. Uh, the big question going forward is will this be a sustainable system? Because it's not altered the system that operated under the old FMC, where um, there is no user charges uh, and contribution to waste management. 
So that's where we've got long way to go, but I hope you find it interesting. Thank you. Joe, that was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, very interesting to hear. Um, there's some common themes that, you know, certainly I've heard around the world, you know, the way that often uh, working as a waste picker is something that uh, newly arrived uh, groups of people do. It's something that is open to all um, in many ways and, uh, you know, brings in some of the people who are least networked and most vulnerable. Um, what we will do is just move. So if you've got any questions, please do uh, put them in the Q&A box and we can perhaps joke and answer them as we go along or perhaps we can review them after we've heard from Harshad. I, I am going to uh, stop talking now. You'll be glad to hear. And I'm going to give the floor to Harshad. So please uh, introduce yourself and uh, the important work that you're doing. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and that was a really interesting presentation from Joe and Mansoor. And I want to take up some time just asking them questions if nobody else is going to after running out. Um, so, it, taking off from what uh, Mansoor and Joe have both said, uh, presenting um, uh, what the overall trade looks like and what is the social structure of um, and, and the different types of waste pickers which are there in Karachi. And um, it's, it, this is it's not very different in India, here in Pune or many other cities. Uh, what I'm going to try and talk about is cover what is it that they're actually doing? Uh, what is the kind of, what are, what is, how does that overall waste management, rather recycling management uh, structure look like? What are the different types of material that they handle? And how we in Pune have been able to run um, a, a project, a system which is able to uh, kind of combine the best um, of what the waste pickers are doing and avoid the worst of what they are facing in most of the countries. Um, I hope you can, see, I don't know why the presentation looks like this, but uh, um, just give me one moment. Right. So uh, we've already covered who waste pickers are, what are they doing? They're mostly informal self-employed uh, waste uh, workers who are collecting waste from the streets and putting it into recycling. Uh, but the one thing that most people turn to ignore is the fact that in any urban center, uh, most of the recycling, uh, most of the post-consumer waste is being recycled through the network of waste pickers, scrap traders, and then informal recyclers. Uh, the World Bank estimates in its wisdom that one to three percent of uh, urban population, urban working population is engaged in informal recycling sector. That brings the India account to anywhere between one and a half to five million or 15 lakh to 50 lakh informal waste because in India. Uh, but locally here in my city of Pune and the uh, adjoining city of Pimpli Chinswood, we estimate that there are around 15,000 informal waste because um, engaged in picking waste. And of them over the last 30 years, uh, 10,000 have come together to form their own trade union, uh, the Kagat, Kach, Patra, Kushtikari, Panchayat, uh, Paper, Metal, Glass Workers Union. Uh, there was no plastic back when they started the, uh, the union. So maybe we have to change the name now. Uh, but uh, that's what it is. And of them, a smaller uh, group have uh, banded together to form a cooperative that's actually providing municipal services uh, to the city. Um, the way that waste management or collection uh, would work in most cities looks something like this, where um, you have the waste collected from the doorsteps, either by a municipal system, which might be vehicles or push carts, or by waste pickers. In Pune, of course, is the Swatch waste pickers. Um, or by itinerant waste buyers, people who are buying uh, recyclable materials, or by itinerant waste because who are walking around. And all of this waste, all the recyclables will go to a scrap shop and from them to aggregators and finally to a uh, recycler. Um, even if it flows through the municipal system, most of the waste is still being handled by waste because in some way or the other. Um, there in Pune, for example, and most other cities, you have a municipal vehicle which has paid salaried employees, permanent or contracted, that drive and man the vehicles. But you also have informal uh, waste because sitting on the vehicles were not paid anything, who will pick the waste and pay some amount to the drivers, like we saw in Joel's uh, presentation. Um, it's a little, up, it's the same thing has now been upgraded. They are helping the, the municipal workers collect the waste, but now they're sitting on top of a vehicle uh, to do it. And they pay a cut to the drivers in order to have access to that waste. Um, if we look at what the waste pickers are doing after collecting it, 
Um, they're sorting it not only into paper, plastic, metal, glass, as we see many of these recycling centers in the West have these four categories put over there. But the waste pickers are doing it at a far greater level. Of course, this depends on uh, the, the kind of area that they live in, the socioeconomic uh, makeup of the city, the, the sizes of the scrap shops, so on and so forth. Uh, but if we look at what are the types of plastic, there are almost 13 different categories that the waste pickers can uh, break it up into. Sometimes these will just be three. Um, but predominantly now, the kind of plastic that is coming into the system um, is uh, colored uh, plastic packaging and multi-layered plastic packaging, both of which are quite difficult to recycle, not impossible, but the logistics um, of it are so tough uh, that it is not cost effective to do it. And because the entire recycling today happens in the private sector, if it's not profitable to do it, it doesn't get recycled. And that's why most of this waste, even if waste because are handling it and capable of sorting it, um, ends up in the landfill. And I'll try and touch upon this point later on again. But the other materials, as we can see, uh, uh, we've done detailed uh, characterization studies of the different types of material that waste pickers are handling. You have hard plastics broken up into polypropylene, um, HDPE, uh, soft plastics broken up into LD and PP and so on and so forth. They also will be segregating it into paper. So you will have white office newspaper, the kind of paper that we usually write in our books. We'll have newspaper, old notebooks, something called road scrap, um, which is essentially low grade uh, paper balls. So if you have uh, uh, butter or cheese packets or any other kind of packaging that comes in paper uh, that may have a small layer of wax or plastic on it, that would all qualify as uh, road scrap. And that's the maximum amount of paper that comes into the system. And it's not very uh, highly recyclable. It's tough to recycle it. And of course, there's cardboard, which is the highest amount of value. Um, metal and glass uh, and other types of materials are just further categories that a waste picker would break it up into. Um, coming back, all of these materials are thrown by the citizens, uh, by waste generators, mixed. If you're lucky to be in a city like Pune, if a waste picker is lucky, uh, you'd have a relatively high level of uh, wet and dry segregation. So they'll only be handling dry waste and not wet waste mixed with it. Uh, but after that, they have to break it up into these 13 to 14 categories in order to sell it to the scrap shops and finally to have this material go into recycling. Um, if the waste pickers are picking this waste from the landfills or from the dumps, uh, or from the containers, they will still be doing this level of sorting before uh, selling it ahead. Now, all of this work that happens in the city has a direct impact on its recycling, on the amount of waste that is going to the landfill, on the diversion of waste from the landfill, and on the total uh, carbon footprint and greenhouse, uh, greenhouse gas mitigation um, impact. Who are these waste because though Joe has already covered it, uh, but other than the fact that they're mostly from marginalized backgrounds and a majority of them are women, in many cities we still see children uh, who are waste picking. Uh, although, uh, while it may be uh, anecdotal, uh, most cities where waste pickers have become organized, we've seen the amount of child labor and waste picking uh, reduce substantially. In Pune, we have we there are children waste pickers who are still there, but they are few and far in between. Very difficult to find. But the work by itself uh, still remains very precarious, no matter how organized waste pickers get. Uh, the perception that society has towards them are still very difficult. They're still perceived as being dirty uh, or people who are stealing the waste if they're found uh, with anything in their hands. Um, and they're often in exist in conflict with the society that they inadvertently serve and the state that they inadvertently benefit as well. Um, however, in all major cities in the global south, um, they are one of the largest stakeholders of recycling. Um, what we have seen in Pune over the last three decades is that waste pickers have organized and they have made very clear what their demands are on the basis of their contribution to um, the city of Pune. Uh, they have first fought and acquired uh, recognition as workers, where Pune was one of the first cities in the world to give an, an ID card endorsed by the municipal corporation to informal waste pickers, with whom in the in the legal world they have no relationship with whatsoever but they endorse these on the basis of concerted demands by the base because uh, who established that the work that they're doing is contributing to the benefit uh, uh, contributing to the city um, the biggest issue for waste pickers is access to waste if they don't have access um, it there's nothing else that they can do it is a source of their livelihood uh, but access to waste has to be coupled with an access to public spaces where they can sort this material, store this material, and then sell it into recycling. Otherwise, you're left with waste that can't be sorted and therefore can't be sold. Uh, 
most importantly, uh, it is the integration um, of their livelihoods into formal municipal systems, um, along with the access to different social welfare schemes uh, that, are at the, that, that are the most critical to waste pickers today. Uh, in Pune, after organizing into a trade union, waste pickers have formed a cooperative, which today in partnership with the municipal corporation services uh, almost 70% of the city. 70% um, of these waste pickers are women, and 91% are from the SC or SG background, uh, the lowest uh, costs uh, as per the Hindu hierarchy. Um, this project has been a 14-year-long exercise. Um, it's, it's existed sometimes in conflict and sometimes uh, in uh, coherence with the municipal corporation, but it is an autonomous organization that functions on its own, where the waste pickers are not paid employees. They provide a waste collection service to the citizens. So instead of picking waste from the streets, they're picking waste from the doorsteps and uh, they get paid for it directly by the citizens. And because of this, uh, this system has been able to expand quickly. It requires very little capital, very little operational cost, much faster than what the municipality itself could have done. And today reaches around 70% of the city. Uh, it has ensured that uh, the hundred odd crores I don't know what that is in dollars, but it's a huge amount. The 100 crores that the municipal corporation would have spent otherwise um, uh, on private contractors are actually going directly from the hands of citizens into the hands of the workers with no middlemen whatsoever, with no potential for exploitation um, as such. Also, because waste pickers want the driveways separate, um, there's a very high level of segregation that over the last 10 years, waste pickers have been able to influence and convince citizens to give them um, in Pune. Um, also, because of that, there is also the highest level of recycling that you can see um, in Pune City. And the city has made spaces like these available to waste pickers um, out of their public spaces. Sometimes like uh, relatively large sheds that waste pickers have free access to. They, it's not on lease. Nobody can disturb them over there. They don't have to pay a commission for anybody. It's their space. They don't get to live there, but they get to come there, sort, store, uh, and sell the material, increase their livelihoods and impact higher recycling. We've also been able to occupy spaces like uh, uh, roadsides and footpaths, uh, which are just uh, uh, where they don't cause any problem to the citizens with portable sheds, where waste pickers are able to store their material. There's around 150 of these sheds, um, of these portable ones all across the city today. Um, like I said, almost 70% of the city is serviced by waste pickers. They collect almost 1,400 tons of waste every day and send 220 tons for recycling. Um, they might have done this otherwise as well, but they would have done this at the end of the pipeline in a landfill in the most precarious conditions uh, with, with a potential negative impact on the quality of recycling as well. And the overall system is designed in such a way that it actually saves the corporation um, almost 113 crores uh, per annum uh, in the, the labor cost, as well as the cost, uh, uh, as well as the money saved due to diversion from the doorstep itself. Uh, the 220 tons that the waste pickers divert, the municipal corporation never has to collect, transport, process, um, or dispose uh, in any way whatsoever. Uh, like I said, one of the highest levels of segregation in the country, um, and in terms of a waste management system, it's highly accountable. Uh, in many cities, you don't know where the sweepers are, what are they doing, how do you track their attendance, uh, what are the waste collectors doing. But because this is a direct user fee system, waste pickers come, they come on time, they come regularly. And if they don't, you don't pay them money. So then they start coming uh, eventually as well. It's not that perfect, obviously. Uh, but with minimum amount of monitoring, um, this system has been able to function uh, in the past, uh, in 2014 and 15, for two years, with nine employees supervising 1,800 waste pickers. Um, servicing around 400,000 properties all across the city. Um, and in terms of the impact that it has, because all the benefit that the base pickers are uh, garnering to a city in uh, informal uh, situations outside in other parts of the world, in Pune, all of these benefits are directly accrued to the corporation, whether it's the number of trees saved because of recycling or the money saved because uh, of the amount of waste that they don't have to transfer. Uh, we estimate that every waste picker of such uh, is currently saving 60,000 rupees to the corporation every single year. I'll just come to the last slide. Is what is it that what is it that is finally critical not only for waste pickers but also from a waste management policy perspective? Um, the ILO recommendation on uh, transitioning from the informal to the formal um, in one of its preambles states that governments need to ensure 
the preservation and improvement of existing livelihoods during this transition from the informal to the formal. However, what we what is happening all across the globe today, and especially in countries like India, which want to have cleaner cities, is that we are bringing in mechanization, compactors, vehicles, uh, waste to energy plants, and these large capital intensive projects uh, that are taking away the waste pickers' access to waste, that are reducing recycling, that are in negatively impacting our cities, not only financially, but also environmentally and removing these environment champions, these uh, base pickers who've been doing all of our recycling completely from the situation. We need legislative uh, and policy approaches to ensure that their livelihoods are preserved and that they get integrated into new systems. Now, Pune is an exception, it's not a rule. We've been able to do it because of the base pickers fighting for the last three decades, but other cities don't have that time and luxury um, across the globe. Their contribution needs to be recognized today and in, not only the waste management, but also the EPR, the Extended Producer uh, the Responsibility and Recycling Policies that countries are coming up with, they need to recognize the importance of waste because it ensure their integration into the new systems. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I think I'm done. Yeah, thank you very much. Wow, what a treat that was. Um, I, yeah, I, there must be more questions out there because I've certainly got, I've certainly scribbled down a, a, a few whilst we've been there. I mean, that was a fantastic run through and great to have, I think, kind of uh, two speakers talking about two different countries, looking at, you know, at, at it from kind of two different angles. Um, and I'm going to just kind of refer to one of the questions. You'll see that uh, Nuno asked, uh, Nuno de Cruz asked a question about what policies or strategies could be suitable to bridge the disconnect between informal small scale private actors and the formal uh, delivery agencies. Um, and to me, I think this is the big question, isn't it? It's how do we make, you know, how do we get the informal sector, you know, with its uh, integration of kind of marginalized groups uh, and the poorest um, and their ability to work in almost every nook and cranny of a city and have you know, really quite exceptional recovery rates for those materials that they're interested in. How can we get them to work with systems that will pick up the material that they're not interested in, that they're not going to valorize? Um, and uh, Mansour, unless you would like, you know, unless you're, um, you've got any other, any other comments, I would really be interested to hear from Harshad and um, Joe, um, you know, yeah. How, how do we how we do how do we do this integration? Um, um, yeah, I'm happy to to wait. I mean, I think Joe, you can start. I will just add one point. Into yeah, that. Harshad, you can have a breather. You're you're uh, you probably need a, a little rest now after that fan fantastic presentation. Joe, please. So I mean, integration really is the word, but you know, as I said in my response to Nuno's question. <clears throat> Mansur and I, amongst many others, have been asking and promoting an integrated approach that um, acknowledges, recognizes, and involves the informal parts of the system within a formal uh, waste management system. We've been asking that for years, and very few people have taken it up. I thought Harshad's point was really interesting, where he, he's, he said that when you uh, the user pays, if the waste worker doesn't pitch up, the waste worker doesn't get paid. That's really important because, um, you know, I, I, I've been advocating for the protection of formal waste workers and the informal networks that they engage with. Uh, but this, it's also a system that is riddled with inefficiencies. So you do have to deal with it and there are mechanisms to deal with it. At the same time, a kind of ideological commitment to uh, privatizing waste ignores the fact that there's already an informal private system that is highly complex, highly networked, and, and often highly efficient, particularly if uh, with the right incentives, as Harshad has described. So, so that's, you know, that's what I would continue to advocate. Lovely, Joe. Thank you. Harsha, please. Um, so I think Joe's covered the point that I would have made. So I'll just put some additional thoughts to it. Um, it 
in in a in a space where the system does not provide for good collection of waste management, um, there is scope to integrate informal waste because into the collection systems. Uh, but there are spaces where that is already being done through private contractors, where uh, either permanent employees or contracted employees who are doing that work, and the waste pickers still exist and are still being removed from their access to waste. Their livelihoods can still be upgraded. Uh, and formalized in this sort of semi-formal manner, you know, material recovery facilities can be set up where they are given free access to waste. Uh, they can be integrated into what should hopefully be uh, our gen my generation's <laughs> uh, wasted evolution, which is uh, in situ composting to eliminate uh, wet waste collection and management across cities. They can be trained and integrated into waste related activities. Uh, they can be supported through uh, extended producer uh, responsibility systems where uh, they get the benefit of sorting and selling the lowest and the worst type of material that is still there prevalent in the systems. And um, the one layer that we often don't talk about is the next one, which is the informal scrap uh, traders who buy and sell most of the materials. Um, and their occupation also needs some sort of support and will go a long way in helping to either formalize or protect the informal work that goes on right now while providing it more dignity. Yeah, Mike, I, I just like to add one point and that, that is that the we also need to think about the protection of certain things uh, rather than integration or in addition to integration. And the way we protect uh, farmer ma farmers market in, in Europe and indigenous tribes in many places and conservation. I, I think two, in my opinion, two things need protection. One is the separation at source practice, especially in the Asian context is extensive, it's not protected. And second is those who are working at the bottom of the of the uh, of the layer of the pillar and they they are not also they are very exposed to changes so how we protect them that is the key key, key question as well so policies on that really thank you for that i mean i, I just kind of have a couple of questions and and, and they're quite uh, heavy in my mind actually because i've just been out uh, literally today in a community where uh, introducing a waste uh, system for the first time how does just just in Pune, Harshad, how does you know for those you're talking about the the, the waste collectors um, turn up because they're paid directly by the householder uh, what about those who can't afford a waste collection and how does one enforce you know how does one get away from the you know the, the free i'm uh, using quotation marks there uh, options of open dumping and burning um you know, how does one encourage people to use actually those uh, the, those services that they're paying for? Uh, so not that's just take the, op you know, the, the free option. So just, that's just interested how, how one makes that happen. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Uh, so uh, it, it has been a journey. Uh, we've started from a place where around six years ago, only 15,000 slum households uh, were being covered by the Swatch Waste Pickers. And that number has now turned to 170,000. Uh, it's still only 70, 75% of the slums. Um, but the balance don't, it's, it's not that they don't pay because of the affordability of it. The monthly user fee cost right now for a slum dweller is 50 rupees, uh, which is less than a dollar a month, uh, which turns to one and a half, quarter to two rupees per day, uh, which is really nothing at all. It's the cost of, it's less than the cost of two bag, one liter of milk, right? Um, it's really affordable. It's not a question of affordability. I think it's more about, um, do your systems stop people from being able to dump? Uh, do you have enforcement mechanisms? Do you have monitoring mechanisms? And most importantly, do you have uh, mechanisms to engage with the citizens fruitfully, to tell them that, okay, you know what? You can throw your waste for free and that's not a problem. Right, fine. But when your children get malaria and you have to spend 50,000 rupees in a private uh, hospital, um, you think about the 50 rupees that you didn't pay to the waste collector who's going to help you clean up the community. Um, engaging sometimes in this you know, cheeky manner, sometimes positively uh, engaging the citizens themselves. Um, like, so for example, all of our waste pickers live in slums. And one of the first things that we do is we tell them if you are going to work in Swatch, you have to pay user fees to your waste collector. Um, and that uh, kind of engagement with citizens does make a huge difference. We still have people who don't pay, uh, who still throw outside. They are a minority. 
more often than not, people don't adhere to the system because they are not told to, or they have multiple voices. They have a municipal councillor who will say, no, 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 don't give it, it's fine. They should be taking it for free. Uh, or you don't have any enforcement mechanisms in place. If all the stakeholders, the municipality, the elected representatives, uh, the local citizens who are interested, as well as the waste collection or management system, all of them give them the same message on one hand. On the other hand, highlight what are the basic benefits to their lives and livelihoods by adhering to the system. And thirdly, if they don't, then enforce it. If you follow these three things, uh, you're able to reach out quite a bit uh, and even service the lowest of uh, uh, you know, the, the most uh, difficult of neighborhoods. I'll just make one comment though. Most of the people who don't pay Swatch today um, live in either middle class or upper middle class or the elite areas of Pune uh, because they believe they have a right to a free municipal system because they pay taxes um, and not the poor who, who at least get this, this one municipal service that comes to them. Otherwise they don't have lanes or gutters or anything else. Fantastic. That's that's wonderful. And I, I do have an uh, another question for you. And um, perhaps Joe, you can follow up with it. But you know, it, it the first thing I was thinking was like, why Pune? Why there? Um, and what's different about there? And Pranav's got a great question saying, how, what's the applicability across India? So is there kind of just a two a two sided uh, two two elements there? You know, why did it happen in Pune? As you said, it was the exception rather than rule in your presentation. Um, the, how could we see it uh, re replicated across India? And then perhaps, uh, Joe, if you can follow up about thoughts about what could be done in, in, in your view, uh, um, the informal sector. Uh, so uh, I think that one, Pune is not really very different from most uh, tier one or metro cities in the country. Uh, why Pune? There may be a few contributing factors. Um, a, a relatively, uh, at that time, a relatively high number of pensioners and a very high number of educational institutions, uh, which ensured that the, the most of the people that living in the city were either people who had retired uh, or young students and young working professionals. Um, both of whom uh, were contributing to the you know, high levels of education in the city. We've also been an epic center of informal labor movement. Uh, very strong uh, labor leaders like Baba Adha um, have been in Pune, the Hamal uh, uh, panchayats, the rickshaw panchayats, uh, the other informal workers unions have uh, in the 80s and in the 70s, 80s, 90s have actually organized themselves in Pune and that also helped uh, quite a bit. We were also lucky just with having um, being in that Goldilocks spot of uh, not being Bombay, which is just a complete monster, or a very small city where it's very difficult to make things happen, somewhere in between. Um, what about the replicability? I don't think the model is replicable at all um, because it is unique to Pune. But while I'm saying that, I'm also trying, I also would like to highlight that the principles of the model are very much replicable. And just like our citizens and our cities are diverse, this model can be adopted to different cities accordingly. Bangalore has a variation of it. Uh, uh, Delhi has a variation of it in some parts. Bombay has a variation in some parts of the city. They've not reached critical mass as we have, but they all, many, many cities across the country actually have different variations which rely on decentralization, um, is integration of informal waste pickers, ensuring that the recyclables stay with the waste pickers so that they get engaged with the waste collection system through that and affording dignity uh, to the waste pickers uh, and preservation of their livelihoods and the direct user fee system. These four or five principles um, have, been there, have been replicated in different ways. Uh, Bangalore has a lovely uh, DWCC dry waste collection centers model where it's slightly differently structured. Um, you have, it's a scrap center uh, oriented model where the scrap store owner uh, has waste pickers associated with them who do dry waste collection for free, but they get all the dry waste and they get to sell it and their logistics are covered by the corporation. Different variations of this model have been implemented across the country and they have been quite successful. We can't replicate it. We need to look at the base principles and not really say, you know, not a, uh, just a tuck, tuck kind of model. <laughs> That's great. So it sounds very, very, uh, very sensible. I mean, one thing you see time and time again is that you need local people who want to take this on, but you need a policy environment that allows it to happen. So you do need the local, you know, 
the local kind of entrepreneurs, the local visionaries, I guess, but you need, they need to be allowed to do it, I guess. There's just one thing that I'd like to add. It's not a response to the question, uh, but it's the overall, not only waste because in Pune, but we've seen in all cities, in all countries, we've seen the resilience of waste because in the last, over the last one year, where no matter the fear, the paranoia, the risk, they have continued to work. They've continued to pick waste or collect waste. In Pune, more than 95% of the waste because in complete lock, the absolutely absurd complete lockdown that we had, more than 95% were present at work collecting every day. And the minute the lockdowns allowed, they continued to work in other parts of the city as well. I'm sorry, Joe, I, I think you wanted to say something. But I, uh, I no, I, I, I just, I, I think um, I would agree with you that uh, replicability isn't, uh, isn't always possible. Uh, when I did the original research, my other study was in Bangalore, which at the time in the mid 90s was probably um, as famous as Pune is now for its waste wise uh, community driven recycling and so on. Um, and as Mike says, you need those local community entrepreneurs to, and um, advocates to keep those things going. Uh, and if you don't, and you don't have them integrated into a wider system, it disappears. My interest in taking the research to Pakistan and to a city like Faisalabad was that there was no history of that. I wanted to, uh, you know, see what happened in the city which hadn't got that kind of history, that kind of NGO culture. Um, and I I would say the gender division here is quite important. So picking up Mansur's part, uh, his point where, you know, women historically would uh, separate at source uh, in the household. Um, I remember talking to one woman who, who said, you know, as a child, she remembered the sound of lentils from a paper bag falling into the tin in the kitchen and loving that sound. And now your lentils aren't bought that way. Uh, it's all, you know, it's plastic and packaging and so on. So how do you preserve or, or retain or resuscitate those kinds of things? Um, and, and gender relations are important there. In the community in Faisalabad, which still is, and back then really was a very conservative uh, society socially, women were not engaged at all in the community. So if men didn't notice or concern themselves with waste, it didn't happen. So I think when looking at that whole issue, you need to think about the gender relations and how you get community engagement around it if the people responsible for community engagement don't notice it. Um, these, these are really uh, an, important issues. I'll stop there and let Manso come in. Uh, Tom, thanks, John. N nothing to add from my side, except there's a question on plastic waste. And um, yes, informal sector collect plastic, valuable plastic waste, um, but they collect it with all other ways. Plastic is, is not an easy material to handle and process and store. So when they have challenges um, from the uh, other waste streams, plastic is, a, is, a, is another difficult layer. But they are doing where there is a value, for example, PET. So we can have more chat on this. Uh, that's that's my separate point to add. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Mike. The only other thing I would raise is um, uh, to come back to a point that came up earlier and I don't think we addressed, which was around um, the wet waste. And uh, I, I wondered what Harshad and, and Mansoor and Mike thought about the whole composting issue, because in uh, the lowest income communities that don't have a service, very often the only waste that is there in the first place is organic waste. Um, how, you know, is there a potential to service those areas through um, integrating a composting uh, approach? And I think that also links back to the question in the Q&A from Nuno about the source of waste. I mean, I, I think it's interesting. I, I um... I would suggest that even in the lowest income um, communities, there will be some level of, um, you know, there will be flexible plastics in there. Um, the sachet economy is something that has been kind of embraced by, if I can call it that, the world and, you know, everyone will buy toothpaste or coffee granules or something in, in, in a little sachet um, for, you know, one or two cents. 
And so it's it's everywhere. And I think that just comes back to Nuno's question. You know, what do we do with these low value flexibles that are often not economic for you know the informal sector to collect? And I think that's a challenge for us all. Um, and certainly that's kind of something that you know I, keeps me thinking. You know, my working hours. I'm just always working out how do we pick up all of this kind of you know the, the lowest value plastic waste. Um, is there anything else we would, sorry, is there anything that you'd like to say before we kind of wrap up and I'll just kind of leave with a few thoughts? No, thanks. Uh, no, no other point from my side. Thanks. I mean, I just, I, to, sorry, yes. Asha, please. I want to try and respond to what Joe said about composting and what you also said about uh, sachets. Um, I, 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 I hope that we are moving in a direction where composting becomes a reality for every household. We, 100 years ago uh, in India, having a toilet in your house was a no-no. It was considered dirty and terrible. And now it's the exact opposite and the government invests thousands of crores to ensure everyone feels that way. And the same should be for wet waste. Uh, that keeping it in your house for too long is considered bad now, but we move towards a space where converting it is the only thing that we are going towards. And even in low income areas, um, if the individuals are not able to do it because of paucity of space, and there's, of course, the rodents and other pest issues that happen in lower income groups, which I won't face in my flat on the sixth floor, you know, uh, but something in the slums would, uh, you can have community level composting that is funded by the municipal corporation, which would dramatically reduce their costs of managing the mixed waste that it would otherwise come to in, uh, to them. Secondly, with respect to sachets, uh, the answer should be to abolish them and get rid of them as soon as possible. Uh, and um, there are people working on it across the globe, but until that happens, those who are producing it and profiting it from it must pay whatever is the cost necessary for it to be picked up by waste pickers and put into recycling uh, and also fund the R&D required and the OPEX cost for running these plants, which can do mechanical separation and uh, management. But that cost through EPR should come from the Coke, Nestle, uh, so on and so forth, the large uh, guys. So that waste pickers will pick it up and they'll give it. I mean, it's a value thing. You give it a value, they'll uh, manage it for sure. And we're doing it in last year, in February or March of last year, before peak pandemic, uh, waste pickers were managing about 100 metric tons of this mixed layer plastic in Pune um, on, a, on a monthly basis, 100 tons per month. But we had to shut it down because of the pandemic. And hopefully, we'll start again now. Asha, that's fantastic. I mean, just to, just to kind of quickly wrap up, I think we've really considered you know, the huge scale of what the informal sector does in terms of you know, the environmental impact, but also the economic impact to the most marginalised and the poorest around the world. And you know, as a species, as we uh, um, uh, become more urban, as we create more waste and different sorts of waste, and trickier sorts of waste to deal with. We've got to ensure that uh, these group of, I guess you can call them waste warriors or environmental heroes are allowed to continue to do what they do um, at you know, no cost to a city's budget, uh, bringing income in, creating, literally creating wealth from waste. Um, and how can we do that in a way that makes sure that everyone has an affordable waste collection, all the waste is picked up and, you know, the, the poorest and the most marginalized continue to uh, and, and benefit more from the waste that we all produce and continue their good work. So thank you everybody for you know another fantastic webinar. Um, and I think I'll leave it there. Sweater, is there anything you'd like to say before we thank, sign off? Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Hasha, Joe, and uh, Mansoor. Uh, I think you guys pretty much summarized everything. And uh, to the attendees, I just want to remind you that you will have access to the recording in a couple of weeks. It will be up on the BWS Rice website. So you will have access to all the presentations and all the conversations from today. So thank you all. Have a good day wherever you are at. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. And great job. Bye.